Okay, uh, we'll call this uh, August 28th Park and Recreation Commission meeting to order. Uh, my name is Kelly Rosecrans, uh, the chairperson. Uh, I think what we'll do here is just do a around the horn uh, introduction. Starting, maybe we're starting with Jim. Do you want? Uh, Jim Chuchuk, uh, citizen. Uh, Jerry Feith, uh, uh, citizen. Susan Feith, uh, property owner and citizen. Mike Hittner, Commissioner. Marion Holcamp. Don DeSorcy, staff. Pat Heideman, staff. Chad World, District 1. Okay, thank you. And our meeting today is being held at the, at the west side of the Mead swimming pool here. So we'll uh, uh, start with the agenda here, approval of the May 29th uh, meeting minutes. So moved. A motion made by Jim. Is there a second? Second. Uh, second Either by Ma Marion to uh, approve the May 29th uh, uh, minutes. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Uh, next item on the agenda, the update on the riverbank clearing of brush between Locust Street and Mead Street. I believe, is that something, Susan or Jerry, is that is that something you want to bring up? Or? Uh, no, we no. came Matt. because it was on the agenda. Okay, okay. If Matt. you recall the last meeting we had, I think Jim Borski suggested that all the commissioners drive by and at that time uh, take a look at the trimming that had been done and see if they thought it was satisfactory and how much and how often we should be doing it. Well, um, I think I think all that can what's been done is about all that can be done, isn't it, with the trimming and uh, without uh, damaging the structure? Or as, as far as uh, engineering is concerned, that's true. Um, at the time it was done, it looked great, but if you've gone down there lately, mm -hmm. um, sumac and uh, some honey locusts have probably grown four to five feet tall in a matter of, I think that was trimmed, talking three months ago, mm -hmm. four months ago. It's already in the four to five foot level, so I think that just indicates that there's a need to do something more permanent down there. So what are you advising Matt to do it a couple times a year or, or what's the solution if we don't, if we do a permanent there is, solution? There is no temporary solution other than cutting it every year. Um, and a permanent solution, uh, I asked Dave Laspa to get me an update. Um, there's a intern that was working on funding for reconstruction down there. And as of today, we had no, no response back from her for an update. So. She was applying for grant money and going through the whole process for a, for a riverbank reconstruction. And that's to cover the erosion problems? Yeah, twofold, help the erosion problems and then uh, hopefully we could keep the desirable species of trees down there and have it looking nice and, and hopefully get rid of some of the undesirable stuff that grows back, you know, at an extremely high rate. <laughs> What you're basically saying, Matt, is that without a major capital expenditure, there's not much more that we can do. Other than a, than a trimming? Um, you probably have to look at trimming a couple times a year if you want to keep mm -hmm. it somewhat down. Is it hard to get your equipment down, uh, down there? It's all by too? hand. Yeah. It's it all be, by hand. Will it be better this fall once everything is kind of dormant? Yeah, it would be better this fall. I mean, if we didn't, uh, wouldn't have had a winter like we had this last winter, our plan was to be down there in April, and that was impossible this year. So, but I mean, one you know, one party would like it more, more of a natural, right, natural element, and one party wants yeah. it a little clearer. But if we can right. find a happy medium, you know, well, just just to comment on that, I think if you look at, if you take a common sense look at what's down there right now. Where I trimmed out under the locust trees, instead of cutting the locust trees, you can see the river. There is no undergrowth uh, vegetation that has grown up five feet there. Uh, it's clear, I mean, and it's it's inviting. Uh, where you guys have, have sawed it all off, it grows back, and it's a it's a jungle, and it encourages all of the worst stuff. It encourages the the bittersweet, it encourages the the garlic mustard and it encourages again the locust. Where you had one locust tree, you got 20 locust trees now. And sumac. 
uh, where it was cut in front of my house, up to the west side there, it's all ceramic. I mean, I had that pretty well cleared out too, but um, by selective cutting and trying to keep the, the decent stuff. I just think that you, it's, it's terrible when you take public money and make things worse, uh, but I think that's really what happens when you go in there and cut. It, it, it encourages all of the wrong stuff. And if you leave that, uh, that shade canopy over, even if it's a bad species, it, it discourages the, the worst of growth. But it, you got to admit yourself, when you look at that section of Riverbank, and then you look at the Tribune side and the Elks down to Locust, you got to admit it still doesn't look like the rest of the Riverbank. I mean, well, it's, that's it's, true. It's, that, that's true wherever you go along the Riverbank. The Riverbank uh, trimming is is defined by the type of bank that has been left us. Manicured? Well, no. Either you have a wall or you don't have a wall. Either you have rubble or you have uh, dirt going to the, the, the water. Now, uh, where there's dirt, you can, you know, you can kind of mow it down there. Where there's a wall, you can mow it to the wall. But where there's rubble, like there is for blocks of, on both the west and east side, those are areas that are difficult to deal with. Yeah, you just can't. I mean, these guys, <laughs> I've seen them go through there. That's, that's really, really hard work. And they don't like it very much, you know. It's all, it's uh, uh, poison ivy and it's thick and it's uh, uh, buckthorn and it's, you know, just bad stuff. If, if you've ever walked down by Jerry, it is unique in the area where of the island um, by the Elks Club there it's a pretty much a, a gentle slope right to the water's edge and where Jerry is it's eroded over the years and in some areas there it's a 10 to 12 foot drop. Well the wall starts at uh, stops at, at Witter. Right. And then from then on it's all just uh, not even nice rubble it's some some of it is concrete that's been pushed down against the river and all that sort of thing that's very difficult you can't get machinery in for sure. It's the same on the other side too. Uh, you know, in the section that we have with the foundation building on it, Stanton's old house. If you look at, and there, there's sort of a wall, but um, over a hundred years they threw in concrete and rocks and all kinds of things, and that's just hugely poison ivy. And it's a place where you don't even want to try to get to the river's edge. We, we struggle to get down there because we have a pump house that sits there. But if you take a look at the difference, I think, in that, that piece that's just on the east side of the river before Mead Street, where we keep about 50 feet of, of um, river bank um, cleaned up, on our own. We, we have some ownership over there on the east side. And look at the difference between that kind of management of Riverbank versus um, what's behind the Imperial House or what's behind his house. You'll see, um, you know, you can't do it in one year. It takes more than one year, but if you control it over two or three years, you can get it to look pretty good rather than clear, <coughs> excuse me, clear cut it, where you get all of those 20 suckers coming up off the stump. Well, after being down there, I can see your, your side of the story, but I also, you know, if you sit on Verwink's patio and look out there, you know, few other neighbors that requested it be thinned out a little bit so they can enjoy the view of the river too. I just want to see both parties happy and a compromise for city machinery and crews. You know, I mean, we don't need to drag this on for another how many meetings. I mean, if we can come to a compromise and each year he comes out and trims just a little bit uh, spring and fall and keeps it thin down there, uh, you know, without disrupting a lot of the, the other natural elements. Is that okay? Uh, just speaking for myself, as one property owner at the 550 residence, uh, 
yeah, that'd be fine. I mean, it would be much superior to what uh, is there now. Uh, it's just that everybody has to understand that that's a couple, three, four years project because uh, now that it's been leveled and, and clear cut, you have all of the worst trees going. And they're going to be they're, they're going to be thick and bushy, and it's going to prohibit people from getting close to the water. The only question I would have is whether you know, selective cutting is something that the city can do. I've discussed that in the past. It's always been, you know, you either send the crew down and you cut it all off, or you leave it alone, one or the other. And, and it really isn't that bad to, once, once you get through it once, it isn't that bad to selectively cut it and trim things up. I did the minimum, because I didn't want to I didn't want to cut trees that the city was not going to cut, or trim them more than the city was planning to do, because I didn't do anything that I didn't want to do anything that the city wasn't going to do anyhow. They were going to do more, always more than what I what I tried to do. Um, so I didn't want to step on anybody's toes by cutting more than the city would have. But yeah, those those trees could be you know they could be cut up a little higher. You could get a much nicer view and still keep that shade canopy so that nothing. Uh, you know, is encouraged to grow as a, as under under story there, uh, and that would be great. But oh, I, I know where I was going with that. Where you've cut um, our, our major person who is complaining and wanting that cut now has kind of a mess there because they do have five feet of bush. You can't see the the uh, the river at all there. But below that is a whole set of uh, river birch trees that I think could come on and shade that area. And they should be saved. That, that, that should be saved because that's the growth that's right down next to the water. And that will save the bank. Uh, and maybe, maybe the locusts have to go and you, you have to... You were talking about using some chemical poison to get rid of those. And, and we really can't other than a hand application because being the, the proximity to the water. Right. right. And, and to use any type of a weed killer and consider that any type of a real permanent solution, it's not going to work. No, I, I, I don't go with, along with that either, but maybe those locusts have to go in some better tree, you know, five, six, uh, a dozen trees along that stretch should be put in up above that, that could you know, do the job that we're talking about doing. That's what I would recommend. And I, don't, I, I know that you're dealing with budgets and all that other stuff. You've got other concerns. Uh, that would just be my opinion. What would be nicest? Well, when this issue was first brought onto the committee, it was about a, about a year ago, May, June, somewhere in there last year. I mean, we don't need to keep redoing right. it now. If we right. can find a happy medium, let the discretion of the park crew go in there and do what they need to do and keep both parties happy, I, I'd be fine with that. I think that the complaint you got came from a person who had just arrived in the neighborhood recently, and I think they're departing the neighborhood from the looks of it. There's a for sale sign on that house, and they have a great big storage pod now parked on 2nd Street. So um, it may not be an issue. I think your biggest issue, though, is going to be that if we don't do something to control little pieces where there is erosion and the erosion is coming closer and closer to the curb, um, you're going to have to do some reconstruction. And I think those places <coughs> are primarily due to runoff from underground streams that are coming maybe from beyond east of 3rd Street down the hill and keep eroding. I would agree. I mean, I don't know the last time we replanted a tree along the riverbank. I mean, I don't know how many years it's been, and maybe there's been a few here and there, but no managed plan of the riverbank in terms of managing vegetation that's along there, whether it's brush or just you know, making sure the trees are, are properly kept beyond just whatever the park groups have time to do. So I, I would agree. And the Hopa trees have been talked about. Mayor Brazo Brown has her fun going to try to bring the Hopa trees back along the river. Uh, we've got a grant opportunity with Canadian National um, Railway to do some sort of uh, beautification uh, regarding trees, and so that'll be hitting a new um, finance property next Tuesday. But um, you know, I would agree. You know, we're, we can't 
can't do anything. I mean, you can't just ignore it. It's going to have to be something, especially as it relates to the walls and those washout areas. Yeah, it can't be ignored or the road's going to be in the river within five years in one spot. So something has to be done. Do the, does the county and environmental people have any comments? Or, I mean, is that worth it? I mean, they have well, if this project would be a go, being that the river front is involved, you're going to have all sorts of people involved. You're going to have the DNR involved. Mm -hmm. Um, you're probably going to have the, uh, I don't know what the current term is for the, the old Valley Improvement Corporation, but um, they'll probably be involved because of watershed management. But you'll have quite a few entities involved in, when you start talking river bank reconstruction. And I don't believe, I know it's been raised by the city attorney, I don't believe we have a policy that dictates what we do and what we don't do along the river bank. And I think it's wise for the council maybe to consider some sort of policy related to that in the future. So the commission doesn't have to be taking these on a case-by-case -case basis. It makes it very emotional, it makes it very difficult for both parties to ever discuss it, plus the commission never feel comfortable making a decision. It's going off of a request and trying to use the best available information and trying to compromise, and that's not always a fun process. I don't believe you were here, Mayor, when I mentioned I, I talked to um, Dave Laspa to try to get an update on the progress from the intern, and uh, I haven't gotten any update from him okay. to this point. Uh, she was supposed to be working on some grants for yeah. that riverbank. Right. So. Well. with this or where do we do we just I don't think any further action needs to be taken by the commission no but it would be nice if, if Matt could get down there maybe one last time this fall and just to do a little touch up <clears throat> and see how it goes for springtime and take it as it is Take part of routine it. maintenance of the, I said, Matt, you had said last fall that that was part of the maintenance yeah, plan for the river banks anyways. You've got crews doing their trimming along there in the fall. Is that not correct? Um, typically up to the last couple of years, that section on the east side wasn't a yearly uh, deal, but it was every other year, every third year. Um, we've tried to be a little more diligent uh, on both sides. and. Generally, up to this point, it's been controlled by the weather and manpower. Um, it, it's been a, a job that's been done when we're slow or when there's not other things going on. It hasn't, to be honest, it hasn't been a high priority. Um, you know, maybe we'll have to make it a bigger priority. Any other uh, discussion, or do we just leave this then with the Leave it with the staff. They kind of know. I guess we can just. They kind of know what the thoughts are. And we can look at trying to do something, you know, late fall down there again. Uh, so maybe, like Jerry says, leave uh, maybe some of the higher stuff, and then cut, cut. Then the other stuff will probably take care of itself when it doesn't get enough sun down there. I hope so. Selective cutting or something like that. Over years. Of that. And I do agree with Jerry. This last cutting actually did more harm than yes. good. Okay, then we'll just uh, leave that with uh, Matt's staff and move forward. Our uh, next item on the agenda uh, are the uh, red red bills. We're halfway through. Okay, uh, well let's move to the staff reports. I think that's usually uh, uh, before anyway. So, that's the staff report and I'll Oh, that's right, I'll go share. All right. Is another one, Jim? Comparison, Jim. 
Does want to share one? Or we can share one. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have volunteered my time. Sure. Uh, the Sandlot basketball court has been finished. Uh, we did pretty much a total rebuild up there. Did an asphalt overlay, straightened the poles, took the hoops down, straightened those out, repainted those. Um, took the backboards down, straightened, repainted those, put new nets up, and then had the whole thing restriped. So if you haven't been up there, it looks great. Um, definitely was overdue, and hopefully it'll get some more use now. So, um, as you're well aware, we had a windstorm in town a few weeks back, and in some areas it was pretty major. Uh, we ended up with a few homes with trees on top of them ended up calling Northern Tree Service in on one of them because of the type of equipment that was needed and the complexity of it to try to do minimal damage to the home as it was removed. And our crew was out there for probably two weeks every day with uh, the trees down. Um, our end of it was probably about 20,000 when it was all said and done. And there is a tremendous amount of brush pickup that's been done and there's still a ton of it out there. So it may not seem too big in some areas, but it was actually pretty substantial. Um, pool and zoo are in the process of being shut down for the season. We're still getting a lot of grass complaints in and they're all with vacant lots and vacant homes. Uh, some of them have been their first complaint this year. Some of them are repeats. What does that mean? Right. Um, Usually what ends up happening is the grass isn't cut, a neighbor will call, code enforcement will attempt to contact the owner uh, and give them 10 days to respond. If they don't respond, they send a second notice to, out to them and to us and we schedule it for, for uh, cutting. In a lot of cases, we're cutting and string trimming. It just is a case by case basis, depending on the situation. Um, we've had some Vandalism continuing. We had a problem at Centralia Center. Um, it forced us to make some changes to the hours that the river walk was open. It's closed on weekends now. Um, and it's closed at nights when the uh, community theater doesn't have any performances going. And that seems to have eliminated the problem. If any of you were at Witter Field the last uh, couple days of the season, you saw water running out of the pavement. Uh, we've got a broken water line there that's gonna require excavation by the concession stand. When that, Some of that is new lines that were tied into old lines from the old entryway, and uh, there may be a problem with that. We really won't know. There's not good plans on that until we dig it up and see what we've got. Um, unfortunately, we're do, we've got a lot of tree loss in town. I'm sure a lot of you have seen it. Uh, a lot of the pines are dying now. Uh, the shallow root system and then a terrible year last year and a bad last third of the summer this year. We're starting to get a lot of stressed trees in town, leaves dropping. I think we're going to have a lot of problems in the next couple of years with that. Um, Lions Park, we did uh, all the perimeter timbers. I had put money in last year and outlay to redo that. It was well overdue. That's all completed. It looks really good. And we also did a partial reconstruction of all that perimeter timber at the zoo as well. And uh, Jim and I had met with uh, Schindler Elevator people and we're looking at options for our elevator at City Hall. 95% um, of the equipment is original to the 1978. It uses hundreds of electromechanical switches in the basement. And we're having intermittent failures and it's getting to be quite a nuisance. So we're looking at our options on that. And lastly, we met here at the pool for a reason. <laughs> um, as some of you may or may not know, uh, spring opening this year, we had some issues. Uh, the water table this spring was at an unprecedented high, which we found out later. Uh, we dug just down the side of that hill over there and we had water at 18 inches. And what happened was when we went to drain the pool, the hydrostatic pressure pushed the deep end of the pool out of the ground about approximately two inches. 
uh, we can take a walk over there where that orange section is fenced off. Our hope was as the season was go on, it would settle back down a little bit. It has not. It hasn't gone back down at all. And now we've developed stress cracks in the deep end of the pool. And it appears we're, we're having some minor water loss at this time. Um, there's no easy fix or miracle cure for that. And we really won't know what we've got till it goes through the winter cycle and see what we've got in the spring. Uh, after some freeze thaw and through the winter, we'll see what it looks like. But um, it definitely shows the need for some near future action. Um, we also have had some electrical failures here. All the contact points are corroding because all the electrical is in the same room as the chlorine. Not a good combo after 35 years. So that's another issue. Um, and our mechanical room underneath the floor is completely hollowed out in the one corner from water leakage. Uh, we had uh, the main ventilation fan failed at the end of the season this year. And we also had some uh, minor failures of other equipment. Uh, the tile is all coming off the deck. We can take a, a walk around there. We can take a look at that. On the, on the good side, we got our lift in. We had no problems with that, but I don't believe it was used once this year, but it was required by federal law, so it's here. That's pretty much the story with the pool and I'd be happy to walk over there with you and we can take a look at that and can see what we're dealing with. Let's do it. And we're starting to lose the skim coat so we're repainting all the time. This You can see where the paint line is. This area typically every two years has to be repainted because those areas are sharp and then we're getting complaints of people's feet getting cut. And over here you can see how high the depth actually raised up. Hydrostatic. Hydrostatic pressure under the bottom of the pool. High water table. The, the bottom of the pool here is about 10 foot 6 inches, 10 foot 7 inches, just to the bottom and then you take the drain basins probably another foot and we had water at 18 inches out in that field. And, and, and <laughs> with Elaine, you have to realize they built this pool in the middle of a swamp. So That's correct. So what do you expect? I talked to Dave Hawks and he said that actually at the time this was constructed, they were warned about the, the possibility of this happening. It took 35 years. Yeah. It. And if we just had the perfect storm this year. We had a ton of snow late spring and we had a ton of rain. And it was not a good combination. Over here, and you can't see it because the water's greening up. From that corner and that corner, we got two large stress cracks, and then we got one running across. That actually is an angled ramp that runs across from the shallow end of the deep end, and we've got a fairly large crack running across there that's probably 15 foot long at this time. I hesitate to do anything with it now because I don't know what winter's going to bring. We could fix it now, and it could be worse this spring. So. The, the game plan now is to wait till spring, see what we got, and we'll have to go from there. Any questions on the pool? Well, well waiting, waiting till, waiting till spring then. Uh, I'm going to have yeah, to drain it early this could year. Create a, yeah. a closure then. Well, what we're going to have to do is hopefully there'll be an early spring. We're going to have to drain it early, mm -hmm. and see what the situation is. In our mechanical room, we have a large water heater in there and it's so rusted out that the burner is held up with bricks tight to the bottom of the water heater right now as well. Mm -hmm. You can see the fresh concrete we cut all the way around the perimeter, put new jets and new piping in there because we were losing 300 gallons a day of water out of that. A day. Do you think that's much, Chad? You should know how much they were losing out of the old one on the east side. <laughs> that was losing thousands of gallons a day. <laughs> and for years. At this point, for filling this one, the only thing I can tell you is the automatic fill valve is running more often. I can't really get a count at this point. We'd have to try to compare at the end of the season what our meter readings were to last year and see if there's a significant increase. Friday, we're going to be doing a couple site visits. Um, Jim Borski from the city is also going to be joining um, their board and some other people just to be kind of doing some visioning and take a look at what the scope might look like. And then it sounds like they will be doing 
uh, an update to the community in the form of uh, scope and architectural designs and all that sort of thing. So, I mean, it's really going to come down to what are the needs, where are the partners, and then what's the dollars look like. And the sad reality is, you know, in, in, in this side of the community, we're going to need to do something. And whether it's it's a splash pad or some other more modern variation of something like that, where you don't have so much overhead and uh, you know, an investment like this in today's world is just not realistic anymore for three months out of the year. And it's sad because you know, we, it's our only pool, right? It's our only only outdoor pool for kids in the summertime. And it's a great way for any income ability to participate and have some fun recreation. But, now in a nutshell, it sounds like uh, you know, it, if I were to prescribe a timeline and I'm not in the driving seat in the YMCA piece, but I would say probably in two years is, is probably realistic. Um, timeline for us. I mean, they're pretty aggressive. Their board sounds like they're really behind it, but uh, it's a matter of you know actually turning dirt and getting the, the dollars in place and who the partners are going to be. And but, that's, that's just for an idea or a plan or a place. No, they they want to turn they want to turn dirt. Yeah, okay, that's the board's hope. And again, I don't know what our appetite as a city and others you know, whether it's uh, private donations or whether it's. Um, other partners, the school district, the hospital, I mean, there's a number of other partners that have been identified as potential partners. It's a matter of do they want to participate. I know we've all sat down with boys, I think the boys and girls club as well. Yeah, uh, right. Sat down with Brett um, at Encourage. Yeah. And you've got the problem, Colleen, with your pool that you can't dive off there for meets anymore, mm -hmm. right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have you had a chance to look at the information that um, I had about maybe four or four and a half years ago? The plans they had made to go and build a swimming pool over there on the east side. Uh, by where was the location? Because I have a there's a bunch of plans in the yeah, office. Yeah, yeah. But they were all outdoor. Uh, no, At least I, the one I didn't I didn't see anything indoor. There was a indoor. Was there? Yeah. Okay. And at that time, we even talked about the property on 16th and Pepper. That was the old. Uh, Glass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That they would purchase that too. So there was plans a few years back about that. doing Okay, that. so maybe Brett may have those. Brett's reviewed all of them. I had the ones from the uh, from the water and light property, um, the water park. I mean, he had oh, a whole variety yeah. of, of what the dreams That's were. That's it, yeah. 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 So I don't know anything yeah. about that one specifically, but Brett has all that. So it sounds like they're going to do a steering committee process in the next couple of months, start doing a capital campaign once they decide some scope and then determine a timeline from there, wherever dollars end up falling. Did you say they had, had determined a location? Because no, no location's been selected. They had discussed a location and that wasn't going to be suitable. No, no location's been selected. In fact, um, everything's back on the table again in terms of what options are. I think they've got maybe five locations. It's all going to come down to scope, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, do you do a competitive swimming uh, with eight lanes and then some splash pad and aquatics and then a new wellness facility? then it's going to require a large site. So I think that it's going to come down to the steering, their steering process this fall, and again, seeing where the capital comes in. Mm -hmm. How do they expect to raise all this capital if we don't know definitely what they're going to do with it? Well, that's what the process is fall. So determining who are the players, who's going to participate, if it's the hospital and the city and the school district, you know, whoever these players may or may not be is going to help them determine how large of scope they go. And then at that point, they won't start asking for money. I don't think there's a lot of that's going to be true. Except in hope they would. Um, so the last time, I think um, Pat Schutz was on the steering committee last time. I'm trying to think about it. Well, no, there was one after that. There was okay. a young woman who wanted one. But at any rate, they, they were talking with Nakusa and Port Edwards and uh, Grand Rapids and all of the outlying mm -hmm. governmental mm -hmm. units as well. And um, has anybody They're still at the table. Again? They're still at the table. In fact, the only challenge, the only one that's not so, so certain is Nakusa at this point, but Port Edwards is definitely back. They're still on the table. Buren's still at the table. Grand Rapids is day to day. You know, I, I think that they would participate depending on what that looks like for them, but um, they're definitely involved yet. Just because they all have some sort of ability to participate, whether it's taxing or bonding or whatever it might be. The problem is levy, but it's just we don't have any ability to do anything extra. So it's all going to come down to private. I mean, not all, but a good portion is going to come out of that private, private ask. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. It sounds like we should have uh, in the next three months. I think as Brett, Brett talked about to City Council that night, 
Chad, do you remember what they or Mary, what they spoke for? Uh, Brett had talked about mm -hmm. there was actual timeline, wasn't it? About three months. Yeah. Come back, the architectural stuff was going to come back and some high level cost estimates. Was it that soon? Yeah, I thought I so. I think so. I thought so. Because they want to get a capital campaign yeah. kicked up from the next calendar year, I think. And unless Colleen can find some coffers somewhere, I don't know. I'm talk to Madison that. nicely and see I'm if there's some money. They weren't too friendly to us, and I don't, they're clearly not too friendly to school districts at this point. Uh -uh. Any other questions? Or thank, thank you, Mayor, for that. But I think we can, at some point, maybe the Park and Rec does want to get engaged in, in looking at some alternatives, maybe for what this site could look like five years out. And I don't think there's any harm in that. I, you know, we don't want to prescribe any solutions, but I think maybe just a dialogue about what alternatives could be here. That wouldn't require so much overhead and maybe still provide this this facility yeah. to some extent for the splash pool and the waiting community. pool, maybe that's what it'll look like in yeah. five years from now or sooner. Yeah. Matt, what was the investment when this was first maybe some of the others know? What was the investment when this was first purchased when this was first installed? And was it solely municipal contributions or were there others in the community? No, I believe it was municipal, municipal. and municipal. I want to say from what I recall the figure was one point some million, one million and change. Okay. Okay. It, it would be hard to do a real apples to apples comparison because obviously nobody builds tank pools and right so. and zero entry and all right. those. In the, in the meantime, we're going to work on this pool too. Yeah, I think that's a good point. So, in the in Matt, we'll be meeting with Matt and all the department heads to go through the budget requests in the coming weeks. And I think obviously we're going to continue to maintain and include some capital expenditures. We're going to have to just to keep maintaining this pool without a, a next solution yet. It's hard to stick good money after bad and something like this, but we don't have an option, in my opinion. Yeah. The only thing would be if, if the structural piece of it it's major. is major, I, I don't know if there will be an easy fix. What's the threshold? Yeah, and that might be something that comes We might have to put a number to it or something. May want to consider. Yeah. I think commissioners would be probably hard pressed to put big money in here anymore because it, uh, you're better off to take that money and put it into a splash pool in, in a waiting pool or something like that. Well, everybody that is old enough recalls what happened on the east side pool. Within a few years, there was what four or five hundred thousand thrown at that, and then the end result was it closed anyways. Yeah, we waited too long to do anything. Can I ask a question. I just I understand that you know having gone through this on several several occasions with different groups, there are strong opinions out there with regard to who should run something like this and where it should be. And uh, then, of course, what type of pool it should be, whether it should be a zero entry or, or it should be something that can um, address competitive swimming for school children, I guess. Um, is there a plan that has a, a, a leader that is someone raising their hand saying, we'll be the owners of this pool? And that, that's the intention with the Y, or in theory, is that we could, and there's some municipal partnerships that national Ys have been able to pull off, and so we've been looking at those models. Now, we haven't committed financially to support that as a city, um, but we were looking at an organization that wasn't us to do that, to maybe A, depoliticize it, and also have them be able to take over operations. Maybe, maybe you have a pool authority or something that's made, constituents made up you of could. the communities and yeah, the YMCA. Right. If, you've, if you've got contributions from municipalities, you probably have some sort of rep representation by whoever's financially contributing. Does that answer it? I mean, I don't know. If, I'm, cur I'm curious your perspective on that too, because you know, we as the city could go about it, but we're never going to get the Thunder Grand Rapids or others to contribute that. Just because they don't view, I mean, they'll use the pool, but they won't contribute. Well, it's a very expensive venture, mm -hmm. and every municipality who wants a pool is going to want it close enough to their um, children in order to make it most convenient for them. Right. And then someone's going to want to run it, but they're not going to want to be responsible for the fiscal right. problems that occur with the operation. And I, 
curious to know how far you've gotten along. Well, the, those municipalities have been meeting even prior to my term. I mean, it's been quarterly, I would say, for years. And I was looking back at meeting minutes for a long time, maybe, I don't know how long in your tenure, but, you know, it seems almost quarterly or twice a year, maybe, has, has been the frequency that we've met since I've been there. I haven't, I haven't been on that committee or whatever. Well, just then been, been meeting, the encourage, so you were at the encourage, you were at encourage that day. And we have two meetings there. Right, right. So, so there was, there were, Okay, all right, so, but, but twice a year then in, in that case. Probably four, four or five years. Or something, yeah, least. Marion had alluded to some of the pool meetings that have been happening, and Jim Borsky's been the city rep on that for mm -hmm. much time. But by having another entity as opposed to a municipality being responsible for maintenance and operation, it just seemed to make a little more sense than yeah. Well, right. If they if they want to take it on, and we're seeing our pain here, it's a challenge for municipalities to take that bite. Any other discussion? That's just a big concern. I've always felt that the, the county should be the one that. You know, does this. Yeah. I agree. You know, as with Jim has been talking to Lance Plumo, but I don't know if he's having any love. No. But you know, the one in one here and one in Marshfield for the kids, uh, that makes sense. And then you don't have the hassle with which community is going to pay their share. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Taxing entities are a lot cleaner than yeah. they can speak for the county. And, and, and they, they get the representation, you know, the hardest part is probably going to be Grand Rapids to, you know, kick into put their share in with everybody else. Then you got your North and South County problems. They're gonna get, Jim's gonna have one built in <laughs> no. Marshfield area. <laughs> no, they gotta treat them the same. They, they deserve one too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, they've got their big outdoor pool and I don't know, I can't imagine that's got a lot of years. That's an old tank. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're probably gonna run into the same situation. Mm -hmm. Have you ever talked to their director over there about their A while back we called them and they, they were going through the same same issues we are. They didn't know how much longer they were going to keep theirs afloat either. No it, solution today. Just it to would be nice to know what the what the citizens, the the families that have kids, would like, because everybody's talking about the indoor water aquatic center. To me, if you want Kalahari or Mount Olympus. Drive to the Dells. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This outdoor pool, 35 some years, was good enough for everybody. Outdoor pool, everybody loved it. Now all of a sudden, everybody thinks it has to be indoor with a slide and a big ladder and a pouring bucket of water and all this stuff. I don't, I don't understand where. I mean, I'd like to hear some citizens input with people with young children. <laughs> versus well, I, a fan full of people that have well, already children grown up, up and or no children at all. Don's got a little trouble. If you're making a million dollar investment, use it three months out of the year, and you've got you know how many people visiting it. That's a, not as worthwhile of an investment as another indoor year-round alternative. Well, and I think if you're looking at it, the YMCA is only going to pool for an indoor pool. They're not right. interested yeah. in outdoor facility. Right. It's too Plus, expensive. you can use your splash pads as other communities have to accommodate that outdoor recreation. But you have to remember the people that use this pool, pool can't afford to go down to the Dells. Yeah, you right. watch the kids that come walking to use this mm -hmm, pool. Mm -hmm. They can't afford to go their down dollar, to the Dells. They yeah. get their dollar, they get their waiver, yeah. and that's their entertainment for the summer. Mm -hmm. and, and if you look at the this, this statistics we got from 207 to 213, it's, it's almost doubled, you know, the usage. The, I don't know if they the doubled the fees. Did you double the fees? Or they they did double them in 2009. 2009, they went to two dollars. I think they were one dollar before that. Okay, but the usage is still there. Yeah. You, despite you got, it's it's a different thing when you go to the Dells. I mean, you go yeah. there for the day and you get a room. You know, and, and, <laughs> I've taken the grandkids there every year. I mean, that's a different ball of crap. I know never. the point I was trying to make is if you know you're spending thousands and millions of dollars on this big thing, you know, you could scale it down a little bit and the children would still have fun and get wet and swim. You just didn't need to be to that high level of 
I think I think Chad, when they when they see the costs on this, it will be scaled down. Don't worry about that because you, you couldn't afford Mark anything near what something. they got down there. Nor do I think the city want to support anything in that yeah. level. We were just happy to jump in and use a diving board. Mm -hmm. You can't hardly do that, you know. I guess when you think about the um, only your statistics with regard to free breakfast that I read in the newspaper, the kids that qualify for free meals in the school system has grown so tremendously. I should think that this kind of an operation would be, like Chad says, the kind of thing that would benefit, say, the west side here, for instance. It's going to be really, I think, helpful to a lot of people who cannot, but not even afford the why. And um, I don't know, you can argue county or city, but I think that it's, it's beneficial to have something on a scaled-down version that kids can enjoy when it's so hot. And, they can't afford to go anywhere else. Absolutely. I, maybe I will be old man, maybe not, but I'm dreading the day that this thing closes down because I know my phone will be ringing oh. all the time. Well, no, I, I think that's why we have a conversation about we've got the site, what else can the site bear? If it's a splash pad or some other variation of that, so you can accomplish an entry you know, just in your neighborhood. You don't have to cross town, you don't have to have a Y membership, you don't have to have any of that. And that was my concern with the Y Collaborative is that the city's going to contribute at all. <laughs> Residents have to have the ability to participate just like they do showing up here. You don't have to have a membership. You don't have yeah. to pay 10 bucks to use it for the day. You get to use it just because you are a resident and that qualifies you to use it. And, but I'm with you. I, I agree. So the deep end here is, has created the, all the project. Granted, we've talked about the deck here and, and things, Matt, but like the splash pad. But this pool could be made into a splash pad very easy. Uh, it'd have to be made smaller. Uh, redo the deck and fill up the deep end and fill up some of the shallow end and, and I don't think you'd have any, any problems. I guess the mechanical room would have to be the piping. You use the perimeters to get the piping back to the center like we did at, at the east pool. The only problem now is typically the splash pads are un unmanned. Okay. And if you're going to have a bathroom facility here, we'd have to probably eliminate this building as well. And that and that's really only going to accommodate some of the small yeah. little kids. We aren't going right. to take care of, the, of some of the ones that Teenagers. need the. They'll be swimming in the it. river. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, uh, I mean, there, it, it's feasible to put something within the footprint of this pool. But, uh, and, and it's still going to be pricey, but it's very feasible. And I, I, I know that. I think so. it's negative to think a community this size would have a pool for the kids. Absolutely. That's, uh, I, you know, I don't know, we can't even talk about that, yeah. I don't think. You know, no. they, the kids should have a place to go swimming in the summertime. You know? But, you know, but it's not fair that the city pay for it and all the you know other communities use it. Well, and this happens to be one of those quality of life things you can control. And you know, all the things that you try to do to be competitive as a community and try to yeah. attract young families and young adults and to make it desirable to live here, yeah. you start pulling away those assets. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, why would you live here? Honestly, yeah. why would you raise a young family if you don't have those places and things to do? Yeah. And that's the story that we're struggling with. And that's why we're going to have to make the investment. We're going to have to bite the bullet and spend some money and be okay with that. Just a matter of listening to the community, what's the community want, and all that sort of thing. And to Chad's point, I think is is worthwhile. What gets me is, you know, they know this pool was in bad condition already ten years ago. Why they let it go so long? Because they shelving plans I mean, and dreams. Because they thought they're going to build a new one. 1999, they could have built a new one, but they council wanted to study it when the pool committee studied it for about three years and then they wanted to study it more and they killed it was there still because they overstudied it you can't study something so long and it just killed it after a while i'd like to know how much money has been spent on studies over the years i know of at least two complete major studies that were done 94 or so and then 2000 yeah. on new facilities yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. We go into a little backup. Pardon. Oh. 
Sorry, we have to back up here, Mayor. We gotta go to the bills. Uh, the bills look good. I make a motion to approve and pay the bills. Second. Okay, motion made by Chad, seconded by Mike to approve the bills. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. I'll move for adjournment. Second. Uh, all motion made. Second. Aye. 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 aye.